Shalom and welcome to Practical Spirituality here at Eshet Torah in the Old City of Jerusalem overlooking the Temple Mount. Today we are, oh, uh, just a couple announcements. Number one is um, everybody who watches my classes, every single person watching my classes, I don't mean once, I mean you keep watching them and you're gaining from them. Your job is to pay it forward because I'm hiring people and that's called the Yom Tov Media Club, which is, I'm hiring a publicist right now, that's big bucks, I'm hiring a social media expert big bucks. I got to put it out there. I'm not, I'm not paying for this. This is, this is just my live feed, but we're going to get a cameraman also. We're going to pay for it so we can, so I can actually move around the room because I'm kind of trapped in front of this camera. I used to use this room like nobody's business. I used to teach classes from that back wall and come flying up around the side, shoot down the aisle. You know, it was like an action sports experience <laughs> to be in this class. Anyway, so please, if you've watched already a few classes, Yom Tov Media Club, Dot com. Get on there. I don't care if you come in on a student level. I don't care what level you come in, just on some level. Okay, I got thousands of people watching this every day. And at this point, I've got 20 people in the club, which ain't cool because I know <laughs> a lot more than 20 people are watching this every day. And so just pay it forward, man. Like, where, where else are you going to give your money? You know, where, where else are you going to buy yourself dinner? <laughs> you know, it's like if you came in at the student level, I think it's 10 bucks a day. That's like... That's like, how many dinners is that two, uh, for the year? Two dinners, maybe, if you go out in, in the city? It's probably two dinners. Like, is it worth it to get some classes out there for the world? Be ten, what's that, 120 bucks a year? You know, that's about a dinner, if you're taking your spouse out or something. So, uh, or it's, a, it's not even a trip to a therapist. And this will do a lot better than a therapist, my goodness. So... So, no offense to therapists, obviously. I'm getting a little warm. <laughs> and the, the other cause I just want to mention is uh, there's a, there's a uh, that's, you got to put on AC if you're going to do that. Um, there's a kala, and it may not work also. If the heat's on out there, it's going to blow heat on us. There's a kala, uh, there's a bride who ain't got no dough. And some people gave very generously. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we've really gotten some generous gifts, but we're still raising money for this bride. And uh, please turn on low, the fan. It's on high. It's the bottom right corner of the console. Okay, so the, our question today that we're handling is why, or how to not fall back on past mistakes. So what happens with, with our past mistakes is that we have, just press the bottom right side once. No, no, the bottom right side once. No, no, don't <laughs> touch that. Yeah, bottom right side. You're on the left side. There you go. Thank you. Stay there until it goes off. It didn't go off. Oh, it did. You're good, you're good. Is that heat? Yeah, I think it's cool. No, I think it's cool. I think we're good. So here's the deal. One of the major mistakes people make is they, mis they fail to measure impacts. People fail to measure impacts. Like, for example, <laughs> right now, you're having like, major negative impacts on people. Right now. Right now, you have major negative impacts on people. For example, um, let's say, let's say um, you're short with your mother when she calls you. I mean, it's like the woman just can't call at the right time. It's always bad timing, okay? So here's the woman who gave, you know, carried you for nine months, gave birth to you. You know, she like, like she would give your, her life for you. She basically did. It's just that she survived the birth, you know? She, um, I mean, she, she your, your, your father too. Like both of them, sometimes the father also can't call. Generally, the mother can never call her daughter at the right time and fathers can never call their sons at the right time. And most of the reason is because they, they, they love giving unsolicited advice. Now, how old do you feel when they give you unsolicited advice? About nine? Well, how long is anyone going to spend on the phone with someone who makes you feel like you're nine? So we hang up on them real quick, except those are the only two people in the world who would refinance their homes. If something happened to you medically, something happened to you legally, they would refinance, they would sell their home. They would sell everything they got. If these are the people who care for you the most, and yet you can't seem to give them the time of day. So that's a major impact. It's impacting you, it's impacting them, and you can ignore that for years. You can just go on for years ignoring that. You don't recognize your own, the own, 
You don't get your own space shuttle crash. You know, when the space shuttle crashed in uh, the U.S., the last space shuttle, they found debris in four different states. So the police had to, like, tape off this, these four corners of four states, you know, for, the, for what's called the debris field. It was this massive debris field with debris everywhere from all the uh, wreckage of that plane. You want to slide over one seat so he can sit down with you? Or are you already sitting there? Oh, no, he's good. Okay. So there was, you know, it's a massive debris field. So your life is a space shuttle crash. Your life, like I'm speaking to you, like your life is a space shuttle crash and there's debris everywhere and you'll just keep going. You're just going to keep going. There's going to be more and more debris and then you'll get married and there'll be all kinds of debris in your marriage and then you're going to have kids and there'll be all kinds of debris on your kids. And you just keep going. So our class, we're here to answer past, how do we keep ourselves from going back to past mistakes? <laughs> we're going forward like with all kinds of debris around us because the answer of how you stop going back into past mistakes is you measure the debris. You got to measure the impact. A lot of us don't measure the impact. So one muscle that I liked very much that I heard from Jordan Peterson was, the, was that the maze of life, when you, put, when you put a rat in a maze and it's gotta like go through the maze and get to the other side, if you can put cheese on the other side, pungent cheese that's gonna smell throughout the maze, so the closer he gets, the more it smells. So the rat, you think the rat goes faster if he's got cheese on the other side? For sure, that's an incentive for the rat and it's gonna move faster through the maze. But they, what they discovered was if you put the smell of a cat, if you like blow the smell of a cat into the exit, the entrance where the cat, where the mouse went into the, you know, where the rat went into the maze, if you blow the smell of a cat there, what happens to the, how fast does the rat go now? Yeah, like four times faster. So no cheese, it goes a certain pace. And that's all the millennials today who like, all the young people who have no motivation for anything really. They wind up in our essentials class and ditching their seminaries and stuff and yeshivas and, and stuff. But they are, just because they've lost motivation to be part of that. So at least, you know, maybe this place will give them some, ins maybe we can provide some cheese. Today I'm actually providing the smell of a cat because of her question. But, uh, but what happens is you, when you smell that cheese, you've got incentive now for something. You might get motivated. Our generation, there's no cheese. And there's no smell of a cat because it's human nature to avoid negative emotion. It's our nature to avoid negative emotion. So the reason you fall back to past mistakes because you never quite measured the emotion in your heart of the negative emotions that came from the mistake. It was just a mistake. Even calling it a mistake is like a bit of a joke because it was a much bigger disaster than that. It wasn't just a mistake. The question isn't how do I f stop myself from falling back to past mistakes? The question is how do I stop myself from falling back to the disaster that my life is when I do stupid things? Because <laughs> it's a disaster. It's a, it is a, another style of space shuttle crash. It's more of a, it's more of a, what are those people from Gaza shoot? What are those rockets they're shooting? They have names? Yeah, they're just rockets. Whatever, they're explosions. These aren't like mistakes. Mistakes are like going to the wrong address, you know. Mistakes are like ordering the wrong, you know, meal or something. These are, these are like disasters. But we don't, measure, we don't measure the impact. And so if you want to be really motivated, you got to think about that rat who's got the incentive in front of him. He knows or she knows what she wants. And you also got to have the smell of the cat of what price you pay if you don't get there. What is it going to cost you? And it means going in deep about that. You got to go in deep and what, what, what's it cost? What's the impact? And there are also future impacts too. I mean, there's past impacts, and there's future impacts. Um, some people work better with the next world also. Like there's some people who are like got a serious fear of hell meaning that you're gonna to have to pay the price. Now, just on the subject of hell for a moment, because a lot of people don't understand Judaism's take on hell. Hell is a, is a world that you weave in this world, while you're in this realm. Meaning while you're in your physical realm, you actually weave this world called hell for yourself. It's called Gehenna. And you, you weave it while you're here. You make it while you're here. All the fabric is woven 
while you're here, and then you go and you got to go into it. When you die, you get to go into what you wove and deal with it. And it ain't pretty over there. Um, it, it's not a nice place to be, but it's all yours. It's 100% yours. You're not going to get anything that you didn't create because everything you get, everything you, cr you do in this world is creating your spiritual life. And so, and so the good moves you're making are going to be eternal and wonderful. And the negative moves you're making that that's, you're going to have to deal with that. It's, but it's temporal. It's not forever. And one more thing. Um, and the reason we know this logically as well, not just from pure tradition from the rabbis, meaning the Kabbalists, the reason we know this also logically is because, have you noticed there's very little consequence for people who make dumb moves? I mean, the people who do moves like steal, there's very little consequence going on. I meaning someone could just rip off some guy's bike and ride it and enjoy it for years on. Just love it and then sell it. And they take that money and pay for a nice suit that he's going to wear around. And, and as far as he's concerned, it's all been good news the whole time. I mean, yes, the law can catch up to somebody. The cops can say, hey, whose bike is that? And then he'd be like, uh, stuck. And now he's going to get busted. But, but he could possibly not get busted. And a lot of people, how many, what percentage do you think of people get busted stealing bikes? Very, very low percentage. I mean, just yesterday I, I was uh, hearing a, someone who was, someone who found his stolen bike, called the cops and said, I know where my stolen bike is. And the cops were like, we don't have the manpower for that. <laughs> it's like, that sounds like Sodom and Amal, Sodom and Amira, you know, lawlessness. Like, even the cops aren't interested. It wasn't a cheap bike, you know. So, um, anyway, but you realize that people walk around without consequence. So, unless God has a sick sense of humor, which he may, but unless God has a sick sense of humor, all of what we do down here has to have a consequence, but you don't see the consequence. I mean, for example, uh, this Kala who we're trying to marry off. So, so, I'm also giving, but from a purely physical level, that looks stupid. She's not my daughter. Like, why am I just throwing my money into the wind for some girl to get married? Happens to be my daughter's best friend. But let's just say it was a random call. I've given for plenty of random brides to help them with their dowry over the years. Now, it must be, I believe, that, there's, that I'm weaving a world somewhere. I, I'm not going to see it here. I'm not going to go into the wedding. I don't know who the family is. I'm just like throwing my money into the wind for this family. And, but I must be weaving something. I must believe that somehow. And I don't believe God has a sixth sense of humor. And the same thing with negative moves is doing the wrong things is I know that's going to be, I'm going to be facing that later. And I don't want to weave that kind of world. And I, I believe that God, I don't believe God has a sixth sense of humor and that we can do the wrong things and get away with it. I don't believe we'll get away with it. I even believe in this world you'll get hit. <laughs> Haven't you noticed you get hit down here too? You get double hit. Because when you're going on the negative vibrations, boy, do you attract negativity towards you, right? We can attract big time negativity into our lives. So you get hit in both worlds. You're weaving a crazy world in the Gehenna level. And you're weaving a craziness in this world. Because once you have that kind of negativity attached to you, there's no end of negativity that can come your way. You know? So, but back to us is we need that smell of the cat. So I was saying regarding the next world, why did I just talk about the next world? I was speaking about it because there's people who are very motivated by the next world. I personally was not raised observant, so the next world means almost nothing to me. I mean, it means almost nothing. I believe it exists. I'm motivated by it, but I wasn't raised with that concept. You know, I was raised that this world's all you get, which is probably why I fill my schedule the way I do, because I'm, even though I know there's a next world, I'm still living every day as if there is not, meaning as far as getting things done. I'm extremely motivated to, to do everything in this world, 
including a whole crazy bucket list of places I still want to surf, which is like, <laughs> Rabbi, you know, get over it already. You know, like, what is wrong with you? You know, but I, I won't let go of it. I just did Costa Rica, you know, like a week of surfing in Costa Rica, unbelievable. Um, check, check, Costa Rica's been surfed. I think my next spoils is gonna be Jeffrey's Bay. Even though I've surfed South Africa many times, I've been kind of saving Jeffrey's Bay, which is considered one of the, it's called the queen of the coast. It's one of the greatest waves in the world. And it's, in a, it's just not where the Jews live, so that's why I keep missing it. But this time, I'm, that's it. Like, I'm gonna go to Johannesburg, teach the Jews, and then I'm flying on some little plane <laughs> to Jeffrey's Bay. And I'm gonna put a check on Jeffrey's Bay as well. So, so the, anyway, but the, the, for those of us who are, you know, like people raised observant, like the people here in H. Oh, you were raised observant? Oh, wow, this is so exciting. <laughs> We need to take a snapshot of you for our donors. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> you also? No, I was. You were. Yeah. You're McCarving this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like here. Yeah. <laughs> You're McCarving this guy. <laughs> so, anyway, that's why we need a cameraman. I fall out of the screen to give a high five. Like, what? what's going on in here? So, anyway, um, but you can have a double motivation. And the way you do that, how do you stop from past mistakes? Is that you have consequence in your future, that's Gehenna. And then, but you also have, like, just think about it. What impact does it have? What impact does that have? What impact does it have? Let's just say, uh, for example, one of you ladies got some guy's heart trapped up in your, in you. Let's just say you got some guy's heart trapped up in you. Now you can play around with impact. Well, what's the impact of that? Well, nothing. It was fun. It was great. It was full of good feelings, everything like that. It was, what's wrong with that? Well, let's project your life into, let's say you're married now. You're married and now you notice that the guy you're married to, the guy you're married to, he seems distracted. Meaning, meaning he just seems like, like he's distracted by, maybe his heart's been kind of, there's a couple slices. Like if the heart's like a pie chart, because the heart is really a pie chart. You know, like I like, I like surfing, I like mountain biking, I like, um, I just picked up another mountain bike, Baruch Hashem. I sold three bikes to get one bike for my sons, Baruch Hashem. So I finally got it all done. I'm just coming back from Tel Aviv where I picked up the new the new mountain bike, but I love surfing, I love mountain bike, I love this, I love, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my career. So my heart is like a giant pie chart. But how would you feel, how would you feel to be married to somebody and notice that their sliced, their heart has missing slices? Would you like that? You want to marry to a guy whose heart's got slices pulled out of it? You don't want that? It would suck, right? But how many of you have pulled slices out of men? <laughs> and, and then you're expecting, like, somehow that's not going to happen to you? Like, why wouldn't there be a Mita connected Mita that you'd wind up with that situation having done that to another man? I tell this, the same thing to men who don't guard their eyes with women. I tell them the same thing. Like, you expect your girls to be good, but you're willing to stare at someone else's daughter? <laughs> Sorry I'm being a little rough today, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this. I, normally I'm nice. But normally I am nice, really. But you hear the question. You hear the question like, what comes around goes around, you know? What goes around comes around, and... And if you want your daughter to be good, like, for heaven's sakes, like, don't look at another person's daughter like a piece of meat, right? And then perhaps your daughter won't be looked at like a piece of meat. And so, so these are all impacts by going deep. You got to go a little deep. You got to think deeply about 
what happened in the past, mistakes that were made, and what, were, what was the full collateral impact, and not just to know it, but even to feel it. Like to feel it, how do you, well how am I supposed to feel it? I could maybe figure it out. You want me to feel it? The answer is yeah, how do you feel it? Well, you get yourself alone in a room, you turn off all the lights, and you put on some, I don't know, maybe some meditation music or something like that, something deep that's gonna bring tears. And you close your eyes and you breathe deep into it and go through that whole scenario. And you may not cry, but you may. And if you can cry over that, you're never gonna make that mistake again. You're, not, you're just not gonna go there again because you need the smell of the cat. You need to know what it smells like back there so that you never go back there again. There's nothing more motivating than the smell of that cat for a rat. And if you've acted like a rat, so, so you, need to, you need to realize what, it, what are the consequences of going back that way? And the answer is, well, I've fully, fully <laughs> become present to the impact that it had. And so I'm, I'm just not going back there again. I don't, I don't go there. And I think all of us would do a lot better going deeply into the impacts of things. All of us would go, do a lot better going into that. Um, you'd find your life in a totally different place if you do, you do that because what it means is you're not susceptible anymore for returning. Human beings, once they've done that full inventory of mistakes, they just don't go back there. And they're just not doing that. You know, I know in my own life, for example, like I made a lot of mistakes with uh, playing cool because I had intense social anxiety and cool seemed to work for me. So, so I was doing the whole cool thing for years and years and years and years and years. But people got hurt. People got hurt by that. And, but cool comes quite naturally because when you have social anxiety and you're anyway kind of naturally cool, so it's easy to go cool again. It's just very easy to go there. And so I can easily go right back to cool, but I can't because I've cried it through, all the way through. The cost that cool had, cost it had on others who tried to keep up with me, some of who are not alive anymore because I, I always land on my feet, but a lot of people try to keep, keep up with me throughout all those years who don't land on their feet. They didn't have my mazel. The, um, uh, there's other people <laughs> who aren't in the free world today because they were not so, they just kept moving in the wet realms that they didn't know where to stop because they weren't Jewish. There's something about when you're Jewish, you're a lot better at not getting caught. That's why recently I was, I, like not recently, like 10 years ago, I was trying, trying to raise money for the legal fees of some guy who was in jail. And, um, and uh, I didn't know who he was, but I was told he was totally innocent. Can I raise some funds? So the first person I call says, says, he's Jewish? I'm like, yeah. He's like, he did it. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning Jews are just so good at not getting caught at what they do. So if he actually got caught, you know, it, it must be he did it. You know, like, there's no other way that he didn't do it. And the guy was right, actually. I found out later he did do it. So doesn't mean you don't get him out of jail. but You don't get him post bail or something because he wasn't a danger to society, but he had done something that was illegal. So, the, um, anyway, there are impacts. For example, uh, how I treated my little brother. I, when you're being cool, you treat your younger sibling well. You let your younger sibling hang around your friends. You let your younger sibling come to your parties. You have a younger sibling in your life. I didn't. And that had massive impacts. I called my younger brother years later, like 20 years later, I called my younger brother. Literally 20 years later. We were both like adults and married. I called my, called my brother and I cried. I, I think for a half hour straight, I didn't stop sobbing, apologizing for the cool years. And so, you think I'm going back to, you think I'm gonna use cool? Think cool's, Think I'm going for cool? After measuring those impacts, think I'm going back to that mistake. What do you think? Hmm? Yes or no? No. No, no way. Not, not once I've, 
once I've been in the debris field and looked at each piece of debris and held it to my heart, I don't go back to those things. Those are not available mistakes anymore. And so that's the smell of the cat. That's when you realize you're just not going back there anymore. It's too dangerous back there. By the way, I'm still allowed to be cool. Like, for example, I walk into the building here and someone says, some tour guide says, oh, it's the surfing rabbi. To, you know, family, you know, like family of 12 here for a bar mitzvah. He's like, it's the surfing rabbi. So I'm like, yo, what's up, everybody? How's it going? They're like, really, you surf? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm from Malibu. You know, I surf. And they're like, that's so cool. And I'm like, why don't y'all come to my class? And they're like, great. So they all walk into this class. As soon as that door closes, I'm like, <laughs> before God created the world, there was nothing. <laughs> they're like, what happened to the cool rabbi? You know? So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using something you got good at. For, I mean, I got good at cool for all the wrong reasons, but it doesn't mean you can't try to make a difference with it, you know, with anything you got good at. You know, I, I play, the reason I play guitar is because I failed at piano. I'm from a family of musicians, so you can only get your instrument once you're good at piano. You gotta get good at piano, learn all the music theory, and then they let you get another instrument. But I failed piano so badly, I had like tater tots for fingers. I couldn't stretch them over the keys. And, and music theory structure, I don't think in structure. I'm a pure creative thinker. And so I don't think in terms of structure. So I failed piano. So you know what I did? I bought a guitar when no one was looking. I just bought a guitar, and today I play guitar. And fairly rock on guitar as well. Should I quit guitar now that I know that it was really just a cover-up for my failure in music? What do you think? Keep playing or quit? Keep playing. Keep playing. I make a lot of people happy with it, lead meditations with it, help people their lives with it. I'm not saying you can't use the things you're good at if you got good at them for the wrong reason. But I want you to get this distinction. Before I had to be cool, now I can use it. Before I had to play that guitar, now I can use it. Even public speaking, uh, I felt like I was stupid when I was a kid because what is the education system, structure or creativity? Structure. It's all structure. Now, I failed that. I mean, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't do math. <laughs> and nothing they were offering was something I could do unless it was like finger painting. <laughs> and... And so that was a total failure. But you know what I noticed? Well, I may be dumb, but I noticed smart people, they speak well. They're articulate. They enunciate well. Their, their vocabulary is large. So I noticed all these things about smart people when it comes to speech. So I said to myself, well, I could never be smart, but I could sound smart. And lo and behold, it worked. Should I stop public speaking? No. no. I can use my public speaking. And, but before I had to, because else, or else I'm stupid. Now I can be smart, because I am smart. Just not structure smart. I'm creativity smart. Okay. Anyway, but that's how you do it. That's how you make sure you don't go back to past mistakes. Is measure the impact deeply. Think about the fact that you're weaving a next world for yourself. And, and just, but you measure that impact so deeply that you just never go back there again. Clear? Questions? Yeah. Comments? Um, yeah. What's it called? What, at what point do you start weaving that nice world, right? Because I, you're like, it's like, oh, it's like when you're able to think, then it's like when you're bar mitzvah, then it's like when you're 20, and then like, so what, How old are you? Uh, 20 in one week. In one week? <laughs> yeah, so I got uh, one week, so the last so got hurrah sure, here. You know. 20 in one week. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, so the, you only weave from 20. The Gehenna world only is from 20. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, except you want to start practicing this week, so you just kind of get a little, <laughs> you want to get a little momentum, you know. It's not like you can become a tzaddik in a day, you know. You know wanna, anyone over 18 should be getting ready for 20, you know, like getting good habits so that when you hit 20, you know. And, and also, there's always tshuva, you know. You, you still have a remnant. There's always a bit of a remnant. Even after Yom Kippur, there's a remnant. You got The world you weave, you can clear it up as much as possible through tshuva, through Yom Kippur, through, 
other ways of, uh, of atoning, but, but there's always a, uh, what's, what the Kabbalists called a Rishima, still a, a bit of a, what's the word Rishima? Rishis. There's still a mark there. It's still there. It's still there. There's still something there. And so, uh, but for sure to do tshuva as often as much as possible, and especially if you did something wrong, do tshuva right away. Okay, any other questions, comments on that? Okay, that's our first class. Shalom.